Good morning. So today we're doing industrial organizational psychology. We're going to resume what we were talking about on Tuesday about work as a sacred space. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about a concept called Dharma, which is from like Indian philosophy. I'm gonna tie it into Greek. I'm gonna tie it into workspaces. Um, at the end, when I do application, it'll be linked to chapter four and task statements. You can see on the board I have, I have, I am tasked with, and I've got um, some task statement things that you'll see in your PowerPoint in your lectures. And I'll go through that in the, in the lecture towards the application and how I use this with clients in practice, the zero to 100, the 48 to 52, um, work environment, Dharma, and um, task statements. So let me share my screen. We're gonna do, we're gonna hop around to several philosophies today. So um, just save your questions because I am sort of time constrained today, which is kind of funny since time is, <laughs> is the archetype we're working with. Um, and then just save your questions to, to the end. Okay, so we're starting with Dharma. And I am gonna go into Dharma and other philosophies and, and other words that they have for it. Even though the technical word Dharma isn't really translatable, I have it as limitation as expansion. Because we have this idea that if we're limited, we can't expand and it's actually the opposite. And I won't sort of reiterate what I always teach you about freedom and the oppressor and Uranus and Saturn, but we're gonna to touch on some of those themes. So the picture that I have here is the Dharma wheel. And I just want you to pay attention to the words, right mindfulness, right view, right intention, right speech, right action. And this is something that I identified in spirituality that got me very confused. And it's something I see a lot in practice. People want to live to these principles, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism or yoga, there's always this idea of right behavior or right action or right thought. And unless we understand what we're thinking wrongly, so to speak, we can't achieve the right. So that's why when I shatter snow globes or I work with clients, I take them to sort of the impurity of the thought, the moment of conception, the zero to seven snow globe, their deadly sins or the thieves that rob their peace of mind. Because if you're not very clear on that, there's no way that you can build up to these right actions, so to speak, the, the yamas and niyamas as they're called in yoga. So part of this month is breaking down this archetype at structure and limitation doesn't allow for expansion or that authority and limits doesn't allow for spiritual growth or even material growth when it's indeed only that that will lead us to these concepts of higher sort of spirituality. So the universal laws we're going to talk about are the principle of cause and effect. It's the same law as karma. This is just in the Kabbalion and the principle of correspondence. So Thich Nhat Hanh says, every thought you produce, anything you say, any action you do, it bears your signature. This is karma. It's not that karma is bad or good. It's simply a result of your action, of your thoughts, of your beliefs, what it is that you put out in the world. And the law of correspondence shows you that anything that's in your external world is representative of your internal world. This is why we want to use our workspace, which is where we spend most of our hours of our day, to use it not only for financial gain, but mainly spiritual gain and understanding what ultimately from work, authority figures, colleagues, frustrations, limitations, we can really grow spiritually. So a lot of mythology, um, Chiron over here is the son of Saturn. I gave you a very long lecture on the 48 to 52, Chiron being the son of Saturn and Philera, but Saturn being time, Saturn being form, Saturn being the castration at the moment of conception. And again, he has his animal nature, his lower nature, which we are all conceived from. 
an animal nature, a low level vibration. I chose this picture intentionally because he looks so pure and white in his lower nature. It is through our form, it's through our limit, it's through our lower nature that we can actually become individuated, define, divine, and expand. This is Saturn, Kronos, which is the main sort of archetype we're going to be looking at all month. This painting is from Goya, and this is Saturn devouring his children. Time devours us. Whether it's time in the day and we're like, oh my God, where did the time go? For having, I was watching Game of Thrones last night and there was this scene where the girl didn't want to ever leave the cave. And I was like, wow, we're always against the time, especially in these beautiful moments that we're sharing with people. They're limited, but we're also limited in our time here on earth, in the body, in our time to do our divine work because we cannot grow spiritually when we're out of the body. We can only change and transmute within the form. So Saturn is constantly showing us that we're against the clock. So Saturn represents chronological time, Kronos, I told you Tuesday. Chiron represents divine or opportune time. So I've shared with a bunch of you about how many books I've sort of written this year, and it's you know only midpoint of the year. Well, for three years, I was sort of dead on a couch and all of a sudden, when I sort of was rebirthed, I now have all this creative energy and creative flow coming out of me. So I'm kind of like making up for lost time, if you will. This is Chiron. I'm in a Chiron return. It is divine time. You are never behind. You are always where you're supposed to be. And you will see this a lot in practice. People feel they're behind. They haven't had a child. They haven't gotten their degree. They're not at the level that they want to be successfully. There is chronological time that has been dictated by standards. You know, we see this in developmental psychology. We see this on birth charts and growth charts when we take our children to the pediatrician. Yes, we're confined to those chronological times of the earthly world, but the divine time of Chiron, the divine or opportune time of the universe is very different. And we can't ever go against that. This is Themis. She is a Titan god. And if you remember in the lecture I gave you about Themis, uh, about Metis and Zeus ate Metis, the Titans is the animal nature. The animal nature, the low level consciousness, the body, the form, the limitation that we see as different from divine. Today, my hope is to explain that it's not, that they're one and the same and that you can never separate them. So she is, you could see her sort of lady justice. Um, she is justice, she's wisdom. We're gonna talk about moving into wisdom with age. We sort of get seasoned as we as we get older and hopefully we, we bend and become flexible and become supple and learn. And she's also the goddess of good counsel. She is directly linked to Saturn cycles, in particular 60 and beyond. And you'll see that significance later. And Indra from Hindu mythology holds order from disorder. And this is an image of, of Indra. There's this belief that, and I've said this before in my narcissism lecture, that the form is the only thing that holds the disorder or the chaos. In every single creation mythology, every single creation mythology, there's a cracked egg, there's a castration, there's something that's limited. The universal consciousness wants to experience itself in a way of form. So whether it's Adam and Eve, whether it's the cosmic egg, they're all saying the same thing, all creation myths. So your creation myth and your client's creation myth is no different. That's why we look at the creation myth to know or the conception story to see what's going on in the rest of the life. That's why the crack in the snow globe, that zero to seven story is so important. But any crack in the snow globe at any point in the story is related to this. We need something to hold all of the divine. We need a form to hold all of the spiritual. We cannot function in the world disorderly. We need a limitation that we feel is limitation. Then we realize it's in the mind and it's not so. So Jung, Jung has archetypes that are called pure and puella. 
So this does not mean that every single one of us is pure or puella and it's male and female. I'm using this as an archetype of youth, of innocence, of, of, of ignorance. Usually when we start off in the earthly realm, in our work life, we're not seasoned. We don't really know how to play the game. Again, I'm watching Game of Thrones and Sansa, you can tell that she's innocent. You can tell that she's gonna get sort of swallowed by life and, and the new to be queen. And that sort of is what happens. That's why Saturn swallows us. Saturn, Saturn um, swallows us in terms of time. And as a result, wisdom as um, wisdom as well, so to speak. So the archetype of pure and puella is used to describe an adult whose emotional life has remained at an adolescent level. So all of us, in a sense, are pures and puellas because I've said we're stuck in child in that inner child in that zero to seven snow globe crack where we didn't get our needs met or unconditional love. The work life, the workspace, those 20, 30, 40 years of work is sort of a predestined, if you will, or a useful opportunity for you to get seized, for you day in and day out to work on meeting your own needs, realizing that you're the, the source of your unconditional love. But this is an actual character that you're going to see in mythology and in, and in um, just cinema. So I have the Peter Pan, who's ultimately sort of the one that never wants to grow up. The poor Perella syndrome is not an issue in the early years because the symptoms are then age appropriate. We expect a seven, eight, nine year old to be sort of infantile and childlike, but it's when we're older, often entering the work environment that it really becomes a problem and we have to grow out of the stage and it's work and the boundaries and the limitations and our limited budget or paycheck or authority or the CEO that really helps sort of fine tune that. And you're gonna see in a minute, the opposite archetype. Pewers generally have a hard time with commitment. Think of when you first started your work life and the commitment that you didn't want to clock in every day or you didn't wanna be there all the time or you maybe lied or you said you were sick. We all kind of go through that seasoning period. They like to keep their options open and can't bear to be tied down. This is this idea of freedom and freedom is somewhat outside of restriction. Now I have to tell you, this archetype is not only young people. There are many older people that have this archetype. This is something that Jung speaks of even in older people. I'm using it as a metaphor of using the seasoning of work or work life to grow out of it. They act spontaneously with little thought of consequences. Pures chafe at boundaries and limits and tend to view any restriction as intolerable. They do not realize that some restrictions are indispensable for growth. And we're going to talk about that at length today. Inantotromia is waiting in the wings. These are people that I say sit on the sidelines. They don't penetrate life. And this has to do with being one-sided. So I told you the other day that work sort of teaches you to have the opposite power currency. If you're very overt, then you need to learn to be more covert. If you're more covert, then you need to be more overt. And it's not in a bad way that you have to become more coercive or manipulative. It just means you need to be supple. You need to bend. You have to become more flexible. But people that never want to get off of their sort of fence, their position, their sideline, they don't grow. It's like staying on the zero or staying in the hundred and never finding that 48 to 52. So the more one-sided we are, the more likely it is that the opposite will break through to spin our lives around. If you keep having a theme specifically at work, but in your life over and over and over again, the universe is teaching you this. The universe is saying, learn the other side, learn that your view is half truth. Like the universal law says, all truths are half truths. Now the pure has an opposite. So all archetypes, have an opposite one that we call the shadow. And so it's vice versa. The pure is the Senex and the Senex is the pure. So if you happen to be extremely rigid or extremely limiting or extremely fearful or extremely old sort of, you know, you might say you're an old soul or then you need to sort of more to soften up and have more of that youth characteristic. But this is usually what we get in work, in life as we get older, which is the Senex. 
This is someone who's more disciplined, more conscientious, more organized. In media or in film or in myth, in uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, we see this as the mentor. We see this as the wise person. So the I Ching, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the I Ching, but the I Ching is, um, it's a really cool book that comes with like a set of little coins. And what you do is you throw the coins and they have a series of lines kind of like this one. And I don't know how many there are um, in the I Ching, I don't remember, but number 60, hexagram number 60 is linked to limitation. Limitation and discipline. Unlimited possibilities are their volume. Somebody has their volume. Jose. Okay, I have to mute you, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> Unlimited possibilities are not suited to man. If they existed, his life would only dissolve in the boundless. This is why Indra puts the form around the chaos. You cannot have unlimited opportunities or unlimited without boundaries. Yes, I called your name because you had no mute, so I had to mute you. To become strong, a man's life needs the limitations ordained by duty and voluntarily accepted. This is important. It has to get to a point of voluntarily that you get there, not that you're forced there. The transmutation in the mind from a behavior of clocking in every day or doing the chores or the dishes, if you're doing it just because you have to, then your behavior is there, but your transmutation, your belief is not there. The point of this archetype, the point of life, the point of time and seasoning and wisdom is to be appreciative that it's there to teach you something. The individual attains significance, significance as a free spirit only by surrounding himself with these limitations and by determining for himself what his duty is. So again, it's limitation, but that's exactly how you seek or attain freedom. So Jung had a term called the unus mundus. And basically he's saying that within the cosmos or the divine consciousness, matter exists. And you've heard me say this over and over, the two states of being, earthly Francis, divine Francis, spirit and matter. This is the theme. There's, there's no way away from it. You have a divine nature that of course, you know, is, feels castrated at the moment of conception with this, with this earthly form and you're like, well, I'm God, how am I not the cookie dough, but you are the cookie dough. So this is gonna be the constant conundrum in spirituality, but also in mental health because people are gonna feel limited and it's all in their mind. So Jungian term of synchronicity is that two things sort of happen unrelated at the same time. And this is actually the spiritual law, the law of correspondence. It's a connection with, connection with your outer world and your inner world. And I live by this law. Whatever happens externally is a message internally. And I've told you guys, if you have a client on your couch, do not chalk it up to have nothing to do with you. You attracted that client into your life because there's something that you're saying that you need to hear yourself. Nothing is out of this law. Every single thing has to do with this law. So advances individuation. I told you that the whole purpose of sort of coming into a form, being that diamond wrapped in honey, is to clean off the honey, to have your divine will, to have your divine purpose, to have a direction in which your will and your soul is going to be organized. This is the individuation process. This is oftentimes where we come into a client's life. The psychoid archetype, means again, just like the unus mundus, you cannot separate spirit and matter. The psyche, the mind, and the matter, and the spirit, they're all one. Psyche and matter are not independent. This is linked to the seven planes in the universe. So I was on this podcast yesterday. I'm trying to explain that this is all happening at once at the same time. All seven planes are here right now. And it's hard for us to understand this. 
So I just use the metaphor of a ladder. Try for a moment to just look at the ladder as the seven planes of consciousness, but really they're all in the same space. The, 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 the rungs of a ladder take up the same, the same space. And this is what we're trying to wrap our heads around. Mind, body, spirit, spirit, matter, divine and earthly, low consciousness, high consciousness. It's a very difficult concept to understand, which I've told you is the principle of mentalism. But basically all states of being are one. Your spirit and your matter are always together. They cannot be separated. And so the Zen koan that says chop wood, get enlightened, chop wood, the person doesn't look any different. Their job is the same, their life is the same, their marriage is the same. It's all an internal process. You get enlightened here when you transmute your belief system, when you identify that the matter isn't limiting you, but rather housing your fire and letting you come to do your divine will as a result of needing a container, because if not, it would just be chaotic. So I use the word archetypes a lot, and today I just kind of want to break it down a bit. Archetypes are patterns, and I've used this before. We have this idea of what like a computer nerd looks like, or what a chef looks like, or the perfect mother. Those are just simple archetypes. They're forms that we associate with a certain energetic pattern. Without the form, we wouldn't really understand. So they're just patterns. Saturn or Kronos is the most noted pattern in your life. This is what you repeat over and over and over. This is your thread. So if in every job you ever had, you had a problem with authority, then that's the archetype. That's the pattern. That's the thread. If you're constantly getting in trouble because you're late, then let's just call it procrastination for a moment or tardiness. That's your archetype. You have a thread, a theme that weaves your entire life together. It is no different. I have a trouble with authority. When I was a young girl in high school, I got in trouble for authority. I have to bend, I have to be flexible. That's just the reality of who I am. And I know, and it's my narcissism and my ego and my pride. And so the universe gives me opportunities day in and day out so that I can work that, so that I can conform to the space that I've been given so that my divine will has the best opportunity for an expression. So when I do an astrology reading, I tell people, this is you on a piece of paper. You chose this time, this moment in time, this place, this exact moment, because your soul is gonna get the most opportunity to become the best possible version of itself with the limitations within the wheel and the cross that you're born. So instead of looking at limitations as restrictions, we have to look at them as opportunities to become the most divine that we can possibly be. And I love the movie Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day is, I think, one of the most spiritual movies there is. And all he does is repeat the same day over and over. The myth you're living is the story you're living. You live a Groundhog Day. You live a story over and over and over. And it's most notable in our work experiences. Just look at your resume. Just look at your resume. Your resume says everything. I remember when I was younger, seeing my resume and I'm like, wow, my resume says that I'm like a jack of all trades. I've got this degree in advertising. I've got a master's in, in nutrition, a master's in public health, a PhD in educational leadership and mental health. What's the thread? And the other day I was invited on a podcast and the guy's like, oh, you have a lot of, a lot of interest. And I said, no, actually it all ties into one, which is the universal law, which is spirituality. But before I could find that thread, I had to hop, hop, hop around a jack of all trades. And I didn't like that. And you might experience that. Your client might try to be finding the thread. That's your job to listen for what weaves their entire life together, whether it's work or family or children or, or romantic life. There is a pattern to your life. I promise you could see it in the astrology chart. Those patterns are archetypes and your primary archetype that is restricting is Saturn. It will usually be the Saturn by sign and house, but work is obviously linked to this. There's always a restriction language. There's always a form. There's always an earthly element, a limiting. It's where you need to learn 48 to 52 and where you become an adult usually at work because you're learn 
You learn to set boundaries and how to have boundaries. Form is the earthly representation of the divine. So instead of looking at it as a, a limitation, we have to say, wow, how lucky of us that we've been given a castration, so to speak, a body, a form, a job, something that um, that limits us. I see somebody has their phone hand raised. Please type in the chat box. I'm a little restricted with time and then I'll see your question. So in the, in the movie Groundhog Day, there's a scene in the diner where he's already lived out the day 20, 30, 40 times and he knows everything that's gonna happen. And he's telling the girl that he's trying to to you know, get um, enamored with or, or, or romantically involved with that he's a God. He's like, I'm not the God, I am a God. And this is why we have limitation. This is why we get, we get limitation is to get to this realization. I am divine. I have a divine spark. I am allowed to express myself in this world without taking anybody else's power. Manning my fires gives me permission and others permission to man their fires. When I set boundaries, I'm mirroring for a client. They can do it. Yesterday I had a client and she's like, I try to manipulate you. And I said, I know, but I don't let you. I have such strong boundaries that I don't get involved in your drama. It's your drama. It's that, that notion of Indra holding the chaos. We have to model that for our clients in our life. And that's what authority figures do in rules and handbooks. They're sort of inanimate ways of setting a container, a boundary, which is what time is, which is what Kronos is, which is what Saturn is, and why it's the planet of alchemy that takes you from that lead and refines and refines and refines you into the gold that you are so that you can reach the idea that you too are God. You are a God, not the God. You're not the whole cookie dough. So work teaches you where you need to surrender. Very, very important. Some people need to surrender in the sense that they have to show up at meetings and talk and other people need to just tone it down. So you'll see that in your environment. So what's the symbology? I've told you this before. The number four in the Asian culture here, she is four is death. The reason is the number four is linked to the square, the squared circle that I have. I don't have it on the board today, but you'll see it in a moment. The, the, the circle with the triangle and the square, the square is the earth, the square is what dies. The earth element is what dies. When you die, you go back to, to the ground and your spirit is what continues. And then you reincarnate and you take on another form. It is the moments of crisis that are linked to the number four, where there are limits, where you're in a square, where you're in a door, where you feel in a box. These are things we said, the slave, the words I used the other day, that are moments for Dharma. And we're going to talk more about Dharma in a moment. Every single moment of crisis is an opportunity for you to do your Dharma, your duty, grow spiritually. They're not there to hurt you. They're there to help you to grow. And the thing is, it's every moment. The other day in the, I think it was the England-Denmark game in the, in the soccer tournament, the, or maybe it was Italy, the guy had like the goalie and he had to hit the ball through, through the goal. At that moment, in that moment of crisis, the whole country cheering him on, everyone looking at him, he went into that and he won. We are offered that all the time. They're maybe not that exuberant and maybe they're not that dramatic and maybe not all eyes are on us, but that's integrity. It's like, who are you when no one is watching? When do you stop, take the breath, and say, what am I going to say in this moment? That comes with wisdom. That comes with age. That's the Senex archetype. That's what your mentor teaches you. And you just get knocked down over and over like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day until you learn that. There are moments to speak. There are moments to silence. There are moments to surrender and just, you know, not jump in and, and have all the answers. I mean, I'm learning this. I'm a know-it-all. These moments show you who you are and what you're made of. These are linked 
to post-conventional morality. I've told you post-conventional morality is when you're acting ethically within yourself, with your ethical system is not a conventional morality of good and bad girl and boy. That's where most people are. They're doing it because it looks good. They're doing it because they should. This archetype teaches you to just do for doing sake, not because you're going to get recognition. It's linked to the symbolism of the square, death, the earth element, and hierarchy. I told you there is no hierarchy in the universe. But since we only know hierarchy in the earthly world, the universe is spherical and cyclical. We have to feel restricted because our psyche or divine nature knows that there's no hierarchy, but we're forced to assume hierarchy or be part of a hierarchical system in the earthly realm. And that's part of why we feel restricted. So I want to go into this concept of Dharma. Dharma in Sanskrit means law or decree. Oftentimes people will say it's your duty. Your dharma is your duty. It's what you're supposed to do. It's what you're doing at that exact moment is your dharma. If you're raising children at that moment, it's your dharma. If you're taking out the garbage, it's your dharma. So it's linked very much to being present, to being mindful, to doing a duty, but not because I have to. It's because I want to, because I'm here to serve. And we're going to talk about the service aspect in a moment. It's a concept in Indian philosophy. You'll hear this in Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism. Technically, if it's translatable, it would translate to hold or support. So again, a container, something that is firm or stable. Again, the, the square is sort of the container or the firmness with four equal sides. It's linked to law, which I told you before was themis, something established, a sustainer or form. It literally is the opportunity to expand the mind. That's why it is not limiting, but rather the only opportunity and the archetypal pattern in your life that teaches you to expand your mind, to get off the fence, to penetrate life, to get out of the zero and the 100. It is this skinny cow that comes every seven years, every day when you walk into your office building. It is the gift that you're given to expand your mind. On Tuesday, I told you that the Greeks called it tenemos, which is sort of that sacred space. And Jung called it the magic circle. And therapists believe that time almost expands during a session when they get really deep with a client because it's almost like time stops still. It's about that Chiron divine time more than the chronological time on the clock. There is a direct connection between the individual and societal phenomena that bind society together. You think that what you're doing in work or with yourself has nothing to do with your external, but we already know from the law of correspondence that all thoughts, all thoughts are material in nature. And if you don't say or act on them, but you have them and they're negative, they create the world you live in. I shared with you the Hopopopopono story of Hugh Lon and how he healed the Hawaiian hospital. We have agency to clean up the world, but it's not out there, it's in here. Dharma is whatever work you are doing at that moment in time. It doesn't have to look a certain way, it's how you show up for it. Your duty is fulfilled by observance of custom or law. So this is important because it goes back to the right action, the right thought, the, mind, the right mindfulness. It also goes back to Tuesday's lecture of work being sacred spaces. If this is where you spend most of your time, how can it not be sacred? This is where you get to show up and integrate and get refined and do it over again and practice and try and have crisis and do it differently and learn and be quiet and one day over and one day covert and become supple and become flexible and mess up and, and fix it. I mean, it's such an opportunity that we get. This is the law. This is the right action. This is not something that you just know. This is something you grow into. And the law is not spiritual law. If spirit and matter, the unus mundus cannot be separated, your divine and your earthly matter cannot be separated, then you're always observing the spiritual law. That's why all spaces are liminal spaces or sacred spaces or thin spaces. So in Christianity, the same term applies. It's called physis. 
Physis was a goddess, a primordial goddess, so meaning origin from the beginning, sort of that crack, a cracked egg or the cosmos when they want to experience um, cosmos through itself. It's an origin goddess. So again, the moment of your origin story, the moment of your conception, the moment of your castration is linked to this concept of dharma. You're here to do dharma in the world by being present and alive and in the body. And in Christianity, it's called physis. It's considered the first born. The moment you are castrated, the moment you are given a body, you have started your dharma. It is order. It's your divine spark. It's your aspect of God and his image, that divine cookie dough in your way of expressing it. And only you could do it. And I have twins. They are different people. Doesn't matter if you're identical. You come with your karma. You come with your dharma. You come with your spark. Nobody exists but you. Of course, we're narcissists knowing this, right? This is called the arrangement of physical reality. It's derived from the world, the word physics. So we've got physics, which explains the ordinary world. And we've got metaphysics, which is what I prefer, that explains the extraordinary world, but that you can't separate them. It's in the world. It's in the word physics, metaphysics. It's the same spirit and matter. In the Bible, it's also known as nomos, which is a word for law. And you can find this in Hebrews and in Romans. And what it says is to live in accordance to divine law. Divine law is all law. It's not separate. Spirit is not separate from matter. Some other philosophies that have the same term, Jainism, I'm using this specifically because it has the word purification, which I will get to, purification and moral transformation of human beings. Purification is directly linked to your thoughts and understanding the impure thoughts so that you can be right-minded and right thought and right action, but is directly linked to the body. All thought is energy. It has to go somewhere. It goes into your body. Your body is a map of your psyche. They are not separated. Everything you think shows up in your hips, shows up in your legs, shows up in your scars. It's all there. If you know how to read the map of the psyche, you know what war zone the person has in their mind. So we're working with a mind, body, spirit, and that's why we pay attention to subtleties when a client walks in the room, the first words they say, how they show up, what they appear, what health issues they're having. These are all inter intertwined, and we talk about that in health psychology. So the body is the purification of the mind. A lot of times people misuse it in terms of eating disorders or excessive exercise or excessive dietary restraints or excessive dieting, none of this. And you'll see when I get to the, the Zen part that none of this is, is divine order. None of this is spiritual. So eating organic all the time and vegan and fighting over paleo diets, this whole thing that's going on on the internet right now is absolute nonsense. The body dies, it houses the spirit. Any extreme is against the law because the law is trying to teach you to be in that tenemos, in that sacred circle, in that magic space. So we need the body to do our work and we need to take care of the body through hopefully healthy foods and exercise and sleeping and, 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 you know, things that purify the body. But again, any extreme is just an extreme and it's a defiance of the law and moral transformation moving from this conventional morality of what it looks like. I'm going to the party because I have to right there. You don't have a spiritual STD. You're not saying, thinking and doing just don't go. You already created karma. You already created, you know, ripple effects in, in the earthly world. So those sort of transformations are the things that, that they're talking about when we, um, when we're looking at the Jainism version of it, but they're all saying the same thing. In Sikhism, it's his path of righteousness and proper religious practice. If we now know that all practice is religious, all things are spiritual, going to work, paying our bills, using the bathroom, cooking a meal. It's all religious. It's all spiritual. Plato had a word called Eusebia. And it said not only to venerate God, so not just a 
technical, spiritual, you know, godly practice or worship, but it's linked to spiritual maturity. That's my spiritual adulting, a reverential attitude toward life and the right conduct. If you have reverence in everything you do, whether it's parking the car or pouring gas, you're going to live this Eusebia. You're going to live this Dharma. You're going to live in purified and in right action and right thought. And that's part of what I'll get to in a bit about learning to get there. And this does come with age and it's not going to be at every moment. Nobody lives mindful 24 seven. That's just nonsense. We have an earthly consciousness. We have a low level animal nature and we have to accept that. But if we could do 48 to 52% of the time, then we're in, in, in good space. So when I teach the Akashic records, one of the things I always say to the people is read the prayer, read the prayer, read the prayer. So the Akashic records prayer is not anything but this little piece of paper that I have in my wallet. And I have it with me all the time. It is my reverence. I don't need the prayer. I'm in the records all the time. It's sort of how I live in the world. But when I sit and read the prayer every day, it's a reverence. There is a practice. Try to find some practice. If it's washing your car, if it's blowing out your hair, it doesn't matter. And give it reverence. So you have this idea of reverence in Eusebia in your life. Another thing is the Stoics. The Stoics have a term named Logos, and it believes it's the word, reason, rational, and divine intelligence. So the form and the spirit together, and that it was the mind of God. And in the Bible, it says, and the word was God. That's how it created the, uni the earth. And it started with the fifth chakra. The word is the ether. It's always the akash, the highest plane that humans have access to, and then built down to the earth. So in Hinduism, there's what's called the ashram system of life. And you've all heard me talk about the ashram. And you can go to visit an ashram in India. There's an ashram right down the street from our campus in, in Pines. And it's sort of something you buy into, so to speak, that when you get older, you're going to go retire into the ashram. And I'll talk about renunciation in a moment. So there's sort of four stages. And the reason I bring this up is to show you Saturn and Chiron. Chronological time and divine or opportune time are always found together. We can't ever get out of the concept of time. It depends on how we view time. That's why time can stretch, as Jung said in a session, because you're not bound to the clock when you're doing sort of deeper reverence work of your mind, of your body, of your spirit. So there's brahmacharya, which is when you're a student, this is around 25 years old, and that's a Saturn cycle. Saturn's around 27, 28 to 30. So it falls in with Saturn. This is sort of what I said in spiritual adulting where you castrate yourself and give yourself a mortgage or a PhD or a child or something. Grishafta is when you're in charge of your household. So you're going to work, you're paying your bills, you're raising your children and it's between 25 and 48. And notice the parallels with my spiritual adulting map. They're not accidental. These are astrological cycles. And you've got Saturn at the beginning and Chiron sort of is the return home that ends sort of that cycle. Mind you, these ages are not exact. This is older literature. It doesn't mean that they don't still hold true. We can speed them up or, you know, slow them down within our, our consciousness. Banaprasta is when you're retired, 48 to 72. Here you have the Chiron return. And I told you that this is around Themis and Saturn returns again around 60. And then again, every seven years. And then a sannyasa is when you renunciate. This is when you sort of renounce all of your earthly belongings, so to speak. And you go to the ashram and you say, okay, I've paid into the ashram my whole life, sort of like tides. And now I'm going to renunciate around 72. Again, to the end of the Saturn cycles till you die. So you see this play of divine time, earthly time, spirit and matter, even in time, when we look at a lot of systems in terms of how ages are broken down into. In Hinduism as well, there's four aims of life or goals of life. Dharma, Dharma is always, I said, it's always what you're doing, the task at hand, garbage, work, 
you know, on a phone call. It's really about being present and doing the duty at that moment. It's linked to piety, morality, and duties. And it's not a spiritual practice. It's just a practice. The reverence is there, being mindful and present. Artha is when you accumulate wealth, health, and means. Wealth and health are always going to be together. Spirit and matter are always going to be together. If you're being killed by the job, if you are in a major level of stress and provoking illness, there's some unmet need. There's some pure archetype. There's some sort of childishness that you're trying to get met by that job. And so we've got to check that with a client when there's illness linked to work or the slave to the system or feeling chained and things that, that we talked about on Tuesday. Kama is linked to love relationships and emotions. So you see, it's important to have relationships whether sexual or otherwise, it's important to have some degree of wealth and health. And then moksha. Moksha means liberation, freedom, and self-realization. When you check yourself into the ashram and you focus on this, the thing is that dharma and moksha are always. Dharma and moksha do not have a specific age, phase, time, or place. They're always. So Deepak Chopra says, imagine that you are without physical form, a field of awareness everywhere at all times. We can't get out of our physical form. That would be dissociation and we don't want that. But what he's inviting us to do is think that you're beyond the form, you're beyond the Saturn, you're beyond the limitation, which is all in your mind. And that you're everywhere at all times showing up as your divine being, even though you know that you're in a limited body. So this is part of my theory, which I'm calling the triad of Dharma. Dharma is sort of the form, the sustaining, the law. So I put this at the bottom of the triangle. And you know that the triangle is always sort of rearranged like mother, father, child triad. And we have a wrong alliance. Um, Ritta is truth, which is hopefully what we're planning on getting to as we have more and more of these sort of refinement stages in skinny cows. And at the tip of the triangle is Maya. Maya is delusion or illusion. It's believing we are the form. It's believing we are our thoughts. It's believing we are what we have. That is one of the main functions of work is to realize that we are worthy just because independent of a title, independent of a paycheck. So this is a very sacred space. If it gets us out of Maya, out of illusion, if we don't get the promotion, if we do get the promotion, if our boss likes us, if our boss doesn't like us, using every person, place, thing, and situation as a mirror, the law of correspondence, so that we can be in a constant spiritual reverence, a constant spiritual adulting, a constant senex authority in our mind that we're in the law, that we're using divinity through our humanity. So my favorite, the squared circle and my Harrow's Gamos image that I always use is no different at work. The principle is the principle is the principle. Here's spirit, here's matter. And everything that you think at work, I hate my boss, I wish I didn't have to do this, oh, this job sucks, whatever, is all thought. It's an all an opportunity to look at. And every single person, every single situation, every single paper that crosses your desk is form and it's structure, and it's an opportunity to do the triad so that you can get out of this illusion, this snow globe, and you can live in the form with truth, your humanity of form, your limitation in form as the truth, which is your divine matter, uh, so your, your divine presence within the matter. This is the perfect opportunity to do the spiritual striptease. So maybe when you're young and you start out, you start having the spiritual TED talk, thinking, emotions, desires, why is this showing up in my life? The first steps of the mother, father, child triad. Then you move into individuation. And I said, this is the process of individuation is huge during our work years. That's why we don't want to use and waste these years as if church or the ashram or the monastery or the soccer field is church. It's all day, every day when we're in the workspace. And so this is very important. If we use this, then we can individuate. Then we can show up as the diamond that we are. We can model behavior for our colleagues, speak up when we have to, be silent when we don't have to. And we can use thoughts and matter 
to our benefit to live in the truth, which then leads us to the spiritual striptease. Most of us stay in Maya, in the illusion or delusion that someone is doing something to us. So this triad at work is just as relevant as in play, as in romance, as in the family, all the, the workbooks that I've provided. So Indriya. Indriya is a concept from Ayurveda. Ayurveda is the medical health system from India. It's a mind, body, system, uh, philosophy, medical system, very complete and comprehensive. You might hear a lot about the doshas and vata, pitta, kapha, and foods for vata, yoga poses for pitta, or herbs for kapha, but it's beyond that. It really is a balancing act of everything, mind, body, spirit. And it's linked to Indra, that God that I mentioned that is the sort of holding back the chaos in the structure. So Indra is the chief deity of strength and power. And therefore, it's through balance, it's only achieved from the 48 to 52, do you actually have the strength, the power, the divine will in its purest form, purification, so that it can come and do what it's supposed to do, oftentimes in a work environment, what you're producing in the world, whether you work for someone or whether it's for yourself. The definition of, of health in Ayurveda and the World Health Organization is somewhat similar. It's mind, body, spirit, and social well-being. We cannot eliminate the social aspect. And social aspect is not just your friends and your family. It's not just your relationships. A big component of your social interactions, of your rituals, happen at the coffee pot, happen at the lunch table. So try to eliminate work from any of this is nonsense because that's where you're spending most of your day. So in Ayurveda, the definition of health is sama dosha, sama agni, sama datu. I had to learn this when I was in school. Malakriya, prasana, atma, indriya, and that's what I'm going to focus on in a minute. Manaha, swasta, iti, abhihayate. Try to say that five times fast. So that's basically everything has to be in balance. Your tissues, your organs, your mind, your body, your spirit. Indriya technically means or really isn't super translation your senses and i've told you that it's through the senses through the form that we steal the fire from our third chakra the greed the envy the lust comes through there and we need to learn how to use our senses our faculties the the better description or the better translation of indriya rather than senses is faculties spiritual faculties, the faculties that control. You control your speech, your right mind, your right thought, your right action, when I showed you in the Dharma wheel at the beginning. It's when you understand and you're out of balance that then you can work towards balance. And your senses, the form, because we cannot separate form and we cannot understand the magnitude of the universe, of our own divine nature, of God, of the world, we need form in which to see it. I have beat this in your brain by now many, many times, meaning our form too, anything that is in form in front of us. That's why if we judge it, it's linked to ourselves and what we're judging in ourselves and creating imbalance in ourselves. So Indriya is the, the principle of the spirit within the use of the, the, sen the senses and the faculties of the senses. So what we want to use is this concept so that we can really have mindfulness in wisdom. So that pure archetype, that youth archetype, and again, that's I'm just using that as an archetype. In, in Jungian psychology, that is someone who just like basically never wants to grow up, that sort of Peter Pan person. But I'm just using it as sort of like someone who's ripe, you know, when you're starting your work life or you're starting your, your adulting. And you learn two things. You learn mindfulness, which is, again, that right thought, that right action, that right, that right speech being present. And you learn wisdom. So I was interviewed on this podcast yesterday and the gentleman must have been around 60 something years old. He was so calm. He was so patient, the opposite of me. <laughs> I'm working on it every day to try to talk some slower, to re you know, rewrite that, that bird story of coming out super fast and furious. 
And his pace dictated the whole podcast interview. And he took pauses and he took breaths. And he was just so sensitive and so kind. And he listened intently and he asked great questions. Like it was such a beautiful interview. And I hung up saying, I want to be like that when I grow up. I'm working on that. Old Francis at 25 years old starting work. Oh, please, fast and furious, know it all. I'm still know it all. But the refinement process that I'm now in my Chiron, that I'm not in a hurry, that the things that I want to achieve are coming because I know divine time exists. That's something that comes when you have right use of your senses, when things that come in your ears or your eyes no longer like, oh my God, I have to have it, I want it. You know, when you're not afraid to just be the authority of your life or set a boundary or model a boundary for another person or say no and set limits. So there's something really special about the time factor and using your senses for your benefit rather than to destruct. And we tend to self-destruct. That's why in the last month's lecture, I told you about the muses. Try to connect to the muses in whatever way that is for you so that you can experience your senses, God through your senses, rather than using your senses to, to self-destroy. And this is sort of the wisdom that comes with age. And that's where you get sort of healthier as a result and the right use of mind, body, spirit, and social well-being. So I wanna talk a little bit about Zen. And we've all heard this term Zen and Om and person's calm and everything's a Zen calm peace of mind. So the Tenzo Kyukin is the person in the ashram or in the spiritual community that cooks for the, the spiritual aspirants or the guru or the person that, the people that are staying in the community, in the spiritual community. And there was a Zen master in 1237 named Dogen who would write a lot. And he wrote these sort of five tenets um, for being Zen. And I wanna use these as things that we can employ in our work environment, in our day-to-day, -day, cause everything's obviously sacred and, and spiritual, but specifically in our day-to-day -day at work. So take joy in service. And I am going to talk a little bit more about service and, and vocation in a moment, because there is a difference. Treat each thing as the body of the Buddha. And you can substitute Buddha for whatever Godhead or, or, or thing you believe in. Refuse judgments and preferences. And I know I always say judgments are confessions and they're great. And they are, but this means a little different. This is about judging that people with higher titles or better quality life are better than you or they should be treated differently. Do the best job that you can and become one with your activity. So I'm gonna go one by one. So taking joy in service, this is identifying that you're both matter and spirit, trying to do some part of your workday. Obviously you're trying to get up the, the channels, you want the promotion, you want the corner office, all that is the material, 48 to 52, absolutely. But the other 48 to 52 is to do things without recognition, to stop and think, to be like, am I getting my needs met? So somebody asked me this yesterday, one of my clients, well, am I supposed to not do something for my kid? Or am I not supposed to do something for my colleague? And it's not about not doing it. It's taking the breath, that pause, the breath before you bite or act or react, the teenager and say, am I doing this to get my needs met? If you are doing a certain action, whether it's collecting the dishes at a restaurant for the, the waitress or you know, making a cup of coffee, coffee for a colleague, just ask yourself, are you doing this to meet your own need? Are you trying to get some validation or protection or safety security need? The answer most of the time is yes but that's okay, you could still do it. But take the pause and stop and recognize that you're doing it for another reason. It's that process of refinement that allows us to get to health. Don't seek recognition the times that you, that you don't need to, again, 48 to 52, and see the service and generosity within the work that you're doing. What are you getting from this? Like, I love teaching. 
You guys are gifts to me. The fact that you want to hear my theories, the fact that you stay after class and ask questions, the fact that you try to apply it to your life. Keisha the other day is saying, what would Yahia do? Like that just, the, the joy that that brings is wonderful. Of course I'm getting something, but that makes me just want to serve you more, even though it's technically my job. I want it to sort of go beyond time and space of the form because it's serving your spirit, or at least that's the intention that I, I create content with. It's about the state of your own heart as you work. Your offering may be small, but as the Dogen said, the true bond between ourselves and the Buddha, and again, substitute that word with whatever you want, is born of the smallest offering made with sincerity. Sincerity is the word. Are you doing this sincerely or are you just trying to get your needs met? And again, if you're trying to get your needs met, I'm not telling you to not do it. 99.999 of what we're doing until we understand that we're doing that is not sincere. But if you could stop, take the breath and say, okay, I'm doing this because I'm getting my needs met. There's sincerity in that. You don't create karma there. You're just simply acknowledging that you're doing this for a different purpose, but that is sincere. That's why you need to know your thoughts. The number one truth on the 12th truth path is know your thoughts. It's the truth of thought. You never, ever, ever, ever stop questioning your thoughts. I have client after client and I'm constantly go to the STD. I mean, go to the TED talk, go to the TED talk. What are you thinking? What are the emotions? What's the desires? Is it mother, father? What don't you like about it? And um, what need does it fulfill? Those three questions are constant. I say those questions all the time, anything that arises, because it keeps me understanding that the purification of thought is linked directly to anything else I can offer in the world service. My physical body, obviously, my health is directly linked to this. And after cancer, I understood the correlation and what I'm putting out in the world, the law of correspondence. So if I do the process of looking at the thoughts, I actually purify my body, my health, balance, the world, the community. It's very powerful to know your thoughts. So purification at work, using the thoughts that you have about your boss or your colleague and how that is coming up in your life on your desk or in an email, that, that squared circle that I showed you earlier is super important. Truth one is the truth of thoughts. Truth six is this, it's the truth of purification. Your body is only as clean, is only as right as your impurest thoughts. So when people wanna do truth four, which is truth of intuition, your intuition is directly related to the quality of your thoughts. If not, you cannot separate the two. So these things are all contingent on one another. It does not matter how much organic you're having, how much whole foods and how much green juice. You could be eating chicken nuggets all day because if your thoughts are not looked at and pure in the sense that not that the thoughts have to be pure, you could have your nasty, dirty, low consciousness thoughts 48 to 52 of the time. Of course you're going to, but you can't get to the hierarchy or the, the higher consciousness, I should say, not hierarchy of Chiron, the divine nature, if you don't understand your limited low consciousness thoughts, no matter how much good food and how much you're building at bodybuilding and, and having weights, these are linked. When your thoughts are purest, when you're acting with sincerity, then you're of service, no matter what, even if it's just handing someone a cup of coffee or a utensil. This is all the sixth house in astrology. I'll talk about that in a bit, a little bit more. Second is treat each thing as if it's the body of the Buddha. Treat, treat each thing with reverence. I know it's not all the time. And sometimes you're just gonna throw something on the table. You're gonna throw a piece of paper in someone's box, but try just to have reverence to whatever it is that you're doing. The Dogen quotes a Chinese Chan master, use the property and possessions of the community as carefully as if they were your own eyes. What do we do at work? We throw it around. We don't take care of it. My mom used to say, return something better than the way it was given to you. Have reverence for that, even if it's not yours, even if you're at Wendy's and you're taking the straws. If we show up with reverence as if it was our own and our own eyes, which is obviously very symbolic of the form, 
of fire, then we can start to live a little bit more healthy. Ordinarily, we are thinking only about completing our task at work so we can rest or get praise for how good a job we've done. Again, 48 to 52% of the time, totally okay. But let's try to be sort of more sincere or more reverent in part of the day. We are self-absorbed. We have to understand we're all narcissists and we think we're God and we're the divine, whether we play small or we play big, whether we're overt or whether we're covert. At the end of the day, we have a consciousness that we come from the divine and we feel limited. When these two psyches and matter start to unify, as we get sort of beat down a bit from life, we start realizing it's all spirit, it's all matter, it all matters. This is about learning how to treat such things that we allow the ineffable to manifest through them. If we identify that this is a version of God, we'll treat it correctly. And I use this on purpose because this little thing is where I record all my client sessions and I treat this like gold. And it looks like a little microphone to you, a little recorder. But to me, it is reverence. So we have those things in our life that matter to us. It might be your purse. It might be your favorite pair of shoes. Imagine if you extrapolated that out to not everything, but 48 to 52. That's sort of like the, the goal, if you will. And then we'll see a lot more sacred in people, places, things, and situations. What helps me is knowing that every person, place, thing, or situation I created offers a lesson. There's something there for me to learn. I'm not saying that I'm God. I'm not saying that I have the answers. Lord knows I mess up 24 seven, but I'm in a constant feedback loop of, oh, that showed up. I created that to teach me a lesson, to extract an essence, to see a mirror always. And that's what I invite you in your client sessions and in your life to use the law of correspondence. Then people start becoming divine and sacred because they're giving you information. That is your intuition at the best sort of form. The third is judgments and preferences. Treat everything and everyone as quality. There are things that we consider junk. There are things that we consider a Target t-shirt. Oh, it's just a $5 Target t-shirt. Well, treat that as equal as your you know, $50 Nordstrom t-shirt. Like start trying to understand that everything is a representation and manifestation of the sacred material and spiritual can't be separated. Your attitudes are gonna change because everything is gonna be important and everyone's gonna be important. It's not just gonna be their quality or their title. So treat the janitor and the CEO the same way. It does not matter that one signs your checks. It's really important that we sort of learn that version of humility that we're all equal no matter what we're wearing. At the end of the day, when you have a spiritual striptease, every single mythology tells you you're naked, nuda veritas, the naked truth. When you get out of the illusion of Maya, when you shatter the snow globe, we are all human, we are all divine, and we are all low level consciousness animals just running around the mud. Nobody is better than other. And treat your food and your belongings this way. You might think because it's McDonald's, that's all you can afford, that it's not, it's not as good as a $10 juice. I'm telling you that if you treat it with reverence, that's why prayer or just saying thank you. I say thank you over my food, no matter what I'm eating, all the time. There are studies that says it shifts the molecular structure and the vibration. But independent of that, just like saying, I can afford $2 chicken McNuggets, it's the same as a $20 steak. See how it's going to, to be in your body because you're having reverence around it. And then doing the best job you can, that you can, I highlighted there. It's common in our society for people to work too much and to be very identified with the outcomes of their work. I told you last week, let go of the outcomes. The outcome is competition. The outcome is earthly, 48 to 52% of the time. The other part of the time, play, that's your spiritual nature. You're doing it because you're, you take pride in your work. You do it because you love what you're doing, or there's not going to be any recognition for it, but I want to add that extra special touch. It's not helpful for us to try to become even more controlling, obsessed, compulsive, ambitious, or self-critical. 
One of the reasons we have a lot of workaholics in this country is because it's the only place we get recognition, even if it's just a thank you. So we overstep our boundaries and we stay very late at work. We work way too much. And then we neglect other spiritual responsibilities like our families. So we don't want to get to that point. Do you know in Europe, they take practically the whole month of August off. The people have vacation. In America, most people do not use their two, three, four weeks of vacation. And it's pride. They, they, like, they pride themselves on not taking their vacation. It's nuts the way we link competition and ambition and hard work to our self-worth. We have to learn to renegotiate these belief systems because they're destroying us. That's why there's burnout and increased stress. And the COVID really brought this to the forefront because now you have your kids at home, you've got your work at home, you're on the clock 24 seven, even if you've clocked out because you get email all the time in your cell phone. So this idea of productivity being linked to our self-worth, again, 48 to 52, you need the paycheck, you want the hierarchy, you want the label, you want the corner off, no problem. But we've got to move past that this is the only area that gives us any identity or worth. Something that I read about that I thought was really funny, there's a sign on the top of this ashram and it says, mindful does not mean slow. People think that sometimes they have to wash the dishes and it's so slow. And for someone like me, who's fast and furious, that would drive me crazy. You could be efficient and still be mindful. It does not have to be that, you, um, that you're slow. Um, this is also an opportunity to not be controlling and a perfectionist. Perfection doesn't exist. And if you could delegate some of your responsibilities, preferably at work, but also at home and such, then you're actually learning detachment, which we learned is learning how to die, which is the archetype of Saturn. And lastly, become one with the work. Just do. No competition or recognition. Go with the flow. Work practice is challenging. This is a hard one for people because we do have it ingrained that we should get some recognition. We should get the promotion. We, get, we should get the raise or the acknowledgement. There are very few other areas of our lives where we are so tempted, att attempted to adopt a self-centered agenda, be obsessed with the outcome or be preoccupied with our performance, comfort, reputation, status relative to others. I intentionally use the Nike swoosh here for two reasons. The other area is sports, even though it's supposed to be play, sports and competition. Now the NBA, uh, the NBA finals and the soccer and we see, and it's like my country's better than your country and all the stuff that we see. So that's another place where it sort of seeps in, but it's play. So it's a little less unless you're the one on the team or you're the athlete. And the other reason I use the swoosh is because the God Nike is a God of victory. It's not competition. It's the God of victory. Zealous is the God of competition. And I told you that the other day, that's your zealousness. But Nike is victory and victory is a spiritual concept, not an earthly one. So I wanna talk a little bit about astrology and then I'll be wrapping up and take your questions. The sixth house, I mentioned to you the other day, it's on the board, the sixth house. Sixth house is ruled by Virgo, this symbol. I'm gonna explain in a minute why it's an M and a P. Chiron is the planet of Virgo. So Chiron is the centaur. We learn our lower consciousness to raise our divine consciousness through work, through service, through purification of our body, through a vocation, which I wanna share with you in a moment. This is super important. This house is actually one of the most misunderstood houses in astrology and one of the most people think insignificant, yet is it so significant. So I put here, physical, mental, and emotional health come into focus in this house. How we handle crisis, I told you crisis at every moment is an opportunity to show up and make the goal. How we maintain control. Do we lose it at work? Do we yell at our boss or our coworkers and then the next day we apologize? We've all had those situations. How we interpret life lessons through fortune and misfortune. I got the job, I didn't get the job. I got fired from the job, I got the raise. We're constant in an, this evaluative stance based on this 
this house work and how we look, the health and the body and the illness and such. Work, duty, and service to others are also governed by this house. So we can serve other and serve ourselves, use others to see what God or the universe is showing us about ourselves. And this is obviously linked to health, which was the definition that I shared of Ayurveda and the WHO. Daily decision-making. This is daily. The reason truth one and truth six are mind and body, the thoughts and the health, is because those two are the myths that Hercules failed at. Remember, Abderus was trampled when he collected the mares, the man-eating mares. And in the sixth myth, in the girdle of Hippolyte, he killed her without even listening. How often do we do that? We just eat emotionally, or we say something emotionally, or we just bite someone's head off because we're having a bad day. These two myths, these two truths are all the time. It's daily, day in and day out. You never get a rest from needing to sleep or eat or poop or think. These things are continuous. These are the gifts that we're given in the earthly realm to do our spiritual work. Daily decision-making based on where we are in our personal growth change cycles are here as well. It's the house of day to day. We must heal ourselves as well as others. The animal of this house is the donkey the one that tends the land, that carries the load, that we feel less than. So this is sort of that feeling that we have in this Groundhog Day mentality of going to work day in and day out. This symbol means materia prima, material, like the prime material. I don't know if that's the translation. It's like the land that hasn't been uh, navigated or hasn't been... Um, that hasn't been tended to. It's the rawness, it's the animal consciousness, it's the low level consciousness. And you get every single day to plant seeds. Jesus has a parable that he talks about all the seeds that are being planted and some fall on the concrete and some fall on the thorns and only a few take. We have to do this every day, tend to our spirit, 48 to 52. This idea that you only need to eat and sleep and poop and meet your earthly needs all the time and not tend to your spirit is nonsense. And work is the way without you even knowing if you're not in that consciousness level that you that you tend to that. That's why it's MP. It's like the raw and you build and you build and you build. Now Saturn rules the 10th house. The 10th house is your authority, your professional image, but it's your vocation. When people usually retire, They'll say, Francis, what's my vocation? What's the purpose? It's usually after the 48 to 52. That's why in the triple goddess, I say 52, you go into crone, even though if you're still working and 52 is obviously very young to retire, you're now looking for your purpose for your vocation. I hear this a lot. It's to do this work. So the sixth house of the day-to-day, -day, obviously your, your, your thoughts, your mind and body, spirit, day-to-day -day work links to your vocation. I have this thing called stone soup. When a client comes to me and they, they, they tell me all the disasters, you know, all the threads, all the stories, I find the thread and I have them write on a piece of paper, like different, um, different words. I talk about this in my Seven Gates book. So I have this one case study of a client who she would always uh, find partners or friends that were sexually abused so all of her papers, all of the, the, the Saturn threads that made her stone stoop was sexual abuse or physical abuse or sexual assault or something. So I had her write all of the threads and make on a circle diagram soup and take a picture. And when you look at that, you see day to day, year to year, thread to thread, job to job, however it is that you're looking at it, you're gonna see the thread. That is linked to your vocation. That is linked to your purpose. It's the wound you need to enter every single day to heal the Chiron wound that I told you in, in the pituitary lecture is the wound from childhood. So your wound from childhood, your Chiron and your Saturn and your astrology chart are very related. How you heal that through your vocation, through your service to feel whole, because remember Chiron, is 
the centaur. We are animals. We are in form. We are castrated. We are kicked out of the universal cookie dough. That doesn't change. The, the wound doesn't ever really heal until we leave the body, but it can scarify and we can work it and work it and work it and it can become our vocation, but we have to be very aware of the wound and the threads through our life and what the law of correspondence is teaching us through the people, places, things, and situations that show up. So Saturn is that Senex, that wise old man. There's a great book by Liz Green that's called Saturn, A New Look at the Old Devil. In Spanish, Saturn or Capricorns are considered viejo niños, that they get younger as they get older because they soften up. So it's the part of us that just through wisdom, we become the gold rather than that heavy lead, I know it all authoritarian sort of, you know, inflexible youth that a lot of us, that a lot of us are. And Saturn's natural placement is the 10th house, which is our professional persona, our throne, our kingdom, and also our vocation. Ages are extremely important. I already talked to you. Divine time and opportune time are linked directly to Chiron, which rules the six, so the day in and day out, but leads us to our chronological time or our earthly time, which is Kronos. These two are related. And I already said truth one and truth six never end. You're constantly looking at your mind and you're constantly feeding your body. And that leads you to the spiritual path. It's that mind, body, spirit, which is definition of Ayurveda. So healthy self is heal thyself, linked to the sixth house of day-to-day, -day, of work, of purification, at looking at the refinement process, your vocation that's going to be as you get older and more refined, looking at your thoughts, your body, your food, your work, your service, as the only way to the divine is your limitation or what you deem your limitation. So how do I use this in practice? In practice, the zero to 100, I always have clients work with those bookends. I ask them about ambition and hard work versus laziness or unmotivatedness because this is a very common um, value system. And remember, judgments are confessions and they're great. So if someone says, I judge laziness or I don't like laziness in someone, it's that they're, they're judging their own laziness. There's a judgment there and a value system of hard work and ambition. And that's okay, it's the zero to the hundred. Now you help with definable, measurable terms, define the 48 to 52. This is all in the client's language. You ask them their definition of ambition and hard work and their definition of laziness or unmotivated or who was lazy, who was ambitious, usually one parent or the other. These are usually linked to bad bucket items or there's someone at their job that's mirroring them. So we use the stories, the people, the characters to identify the thread. Another question I ask clients, it's on the board is, what are you tasked with? I am tasked with, I have to take care of everything. I have to cook and clean and take care of my husband and put his socks on and bring my kids to school. And no, that's how they're linking their worth, their self, their self worth. So that is a very key question I ask cl clients. What they feel they're tasked with, either at work or in their life, will tell you and link to the thread that they come to work on and how they're getting their self worth they think their needs met with that. Another question I ask is who had ultimate control in childhood? One of the, get, the things I get a lot, and obviously it's mirroring a lot of my own history, is God. In my case, it was the, the, the spirit that I was named after in the cult. So when you hear God or religion or these sort of, or intellect that was sort of the God or had the ultimate control, then you can see in the triad who has what the victim, rescuer, perpetrator archetype, or um, the Dharma, Ritta, and, and Maya archetypes that I shared with you earlier. So in chapter four, you have what's called a task statement. You also have this in your PowerPoint in your Blackboard. And what it asks you to do, and this is directly related to like job, uh, job statements, job descriptions, things like that. But I do this with clients. So again, I extrapolate the IO concepts into a more uh, a practical setting in, in the union 
you know, world that I work in. So ask them by the end of the session, for instance, or by the end of the time with you or by the end of their life, because we're, we're looking at an ag- exit strategy that's linked to death, right? Of becoming a spiritual being or refinement process, what they want to, to accomplish. What do they want to do? What is it that they want? How is it and what time frame? This is another way of doing the rule book or the philosophy of life, defining and measurable. Earthly and spiritual goals use the same constructs. This is a very earthly thing that you see at work, a task statement. By the end of this session or by the end of this um, this training, you're going to know what to do. Enter you know, numbers in an Excel, Excel spreadsheet or uh, how to you know, hang a nail, what, whatever. We use the same constructs in spirituality as we do in the earthly realm, which is all that I did for all of my workbooks. And lastly, asking what the action, like what performs what action, what does the task take you to, to learn what action or for whom or to produce. This is important linked to needs using what tools you all have positive tools your clients have coping mechanisms that help them so this is where we start sort of integrating those collaborative voices and the competitive voices again definable and measurable and standard and concise this does not change this is what we find at work these are the things that you're going to learn all month in io in terms of workplace management job descriptions reviews all of that, it's no different for the mental health and the spiritual health. One last thing I want to focus on, I hope you guys can see it, is my board. So I basically drew a circle. So that's like sort of the kingdom. The 48 to 52 is you. Time, money, resources. Time, money, resources are your boundaries, is your self-worth, is the currency of a session, okay? I don't give extra time because I'm mirroring for a client that my time is valuable. I'm showing them that what they're paying for is valuable. This is in addition to my own self-worth strategy for being a therapist. You wanna end and start on time, be respectful of someone's time and your own time. So your time, your energy, your money, your resources, currency of self-worth. If you work in a work environment, in, in an office, like I've said before in the game of life, you're gonna have all 12 archetypes in your job. Identify which are the archetypes that frustrate you. You're going to have the CEO or someone who's an authority figure over you. You're going to have Saturn who represents limits. You're going to have the black moon, someone who tells the truth, maybe in a vulgar way, but they're always telling the truth. Someone who's very chaotic, very disruptive, Uranus. You're going to have Chiron, maybe someone who's of service or pretends to be of service. Remember, there's light and dark on these archetypes. They're not always going to come out in the highest vibration. The sun is someone who's maybe very rational, logical, and has like no flexibility or can't see anything emotional. Then you're going to have the moon or someone who's excessively emotional in their talking or their sharing. You're going to have Neptune, the idealist. There's always an idealist. You're going to have someone who's very Mars, aggressive, assertive, conflict, power, currency, validation, ambitious. And you're going to have Pluto, which is like a disruptor, someone who comes to disrupt the organization or the structure or a meeting. And lastly, you're going to have Venus, someone who's either very heart, because at a high vibration, it could be the agape love, and they're trying to mirror the heart, or they're just very vain, or they're, they're dealing a lot with the money. So identify which of the archetypes in your client's work environment or in your work environment you have trouble with. There's a thread there for you about what you need to work on in terms using the law of correspondence, the archetypes that Saturn is coming to help you integrate. So I'm going to stop the recording and then I'll take your questions and do attendance. How do I do?